Uh, when we're doing our fishing derby, we are attempting to link three different Sundays together with that. Easter Sunday will be kind of a kickoff to, to, to give all of our guests, we're hoping to have that as a big event itself, the Easter Sunday, to invite people. I have invite cards that were getting printed for that, just like we did for last friend day. And we're going to then uh, encourage them with an incentive to come the following Sunday for kids to get their free fishing gear before the fishing derby event. And everybody pre-registered by a certain date will get that uh, in ages 3 through 11 for sure, and maybe even more of the age group. So this is an awesome opportunity to get kids, uh, get them a, a fishing combo kit that's really cool. And then we're going to have the fishing derby, obviously, April 24th, 25th at Call Lake. It's all the Call Lake system. Uh, we will be headquartered at the group camp at Sarge Creek. Uh, there'll be a final weigh-in uh, on that Saturday, the 25th at four o'clock, followed by a fish fry and some drawings for prizes. But it will be the following Sunday, the third Sunday I'm talking about, that we're gonna be able to have kids that were involved in that uh, to get their trophies here in their worship service. We want them up on stage to honor them, get them back in church. Hopefully we'll have them one, two, three opportunities. They can be in church with us and hoping this will be an outreach. Agape is doing the same thing, so just keep that in mind. You'll hear more about that a little bit later. I hoping to have the website launched really, really soon. And one more thing, I'm not sure if this was intended for me to read. I noticed Mike and Julie are here, Mike and Julie Fox, but I do have a, a, a note, dear ladies, thank you so much for the awesome lunch y'all provided to the Velma Mitchell's family. With love, Mike, Sherry, Karen, and Donna. So thank you for that, and it's good to see you. Let's all make sure we encourage them and keep their family in our prayers. Are you ready to go? Are you ready to go? Yes. Who's got the closing prayer? <laughs> Carl's ready to go. Open your, before I tell you where to go, let me, let me just, let me ask you something. That didn't sound very well. <laughs> if I were to ask the question, what would you say is the motto verse of Churches of Christ, the, the mantra, if you will, the, the main key, key point verse of Churches of Christ, what would you say that verse is? And on the count of three, everybody together and say that in unison. One, two, three. Yeah, that went about as well as I thought it would. Who said Acts 2.38? You win the prize. If you were to poll people in the church, I think, if you were to poll people who know about Church of Christ, that's probably at least one of the top five, if not top three answers you're going to get. Acts 2.38. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. As I mentioned last week, we're taking a, a break from the Sermon on the Mount. We'll be right back into that. I'm not here next Sunday, I'm on vacation. Jacob's going to be delivering the lesson, but when I'm back in the saddle, we're going to continue the Sermon on the Mount until we get to Easter. Then we're going to change the theme a little bit, but we'll be going through the Gospel of Matthew still on Sunday mornings for the most part for this year. But we're, we've taken a little break from it because we wanted to interject a little bit about church growth here. I'm doing a study in the adult class, NPR class on Sunday mornings about how we improve our efficiency in church growth using Ephesians chapter 4. And I might remind us tonight that we have a 24 to double learning module that you, I'm encouraging you. If you've not been to one, please come to one, at least one. Uh, five o'clock worship, 5.30, we'll stop worship. We'll go uh, into the multi-purpose room and watch a, a video about 25, 30 minutes long, have discussion about how we get together with our teams assimilated teams and, and have effective church growth. But in Acts chapter 2, you'll know the story. It's familiar to all of us. Um, it's the day of Pentecost. Okay, It's 50 days after Jesus' uh, death, burial, resurrection. Ten days before this, Jesus has ascended back to the Father. You might recall His final words to His disciples recorded in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, 16. And I think I heard somebody say Mark 16, 16, or those possible answers a while ago. These words of Jesus to his disciples before he left earth were, were basically the words of saying, go save the world. Teach and baptize every person. 
He that believes and is baptized will be saved. That's those two passages. What do we know those two passages as? What's, what, what term do we give that? The great what? The great commission. Let's say that together. The great commission. He wants us to make disciples of everyone in the world. Now that's, that's key. It's important for us to know that assignment he gave, his final words were, go make disciples. Go convert. Seek and save the lost is what he said his mission was. Luke 19 verse 10. And if we follow Jesus, that's what our mission is. Amen? Amen. To seek and to save the lost. Now, he does mean seek. Search them out. Don't sit and wait for them to come to church services so that they might get saved. But we are to be an outward reaching church. So here we are on the day of Pentecost now, a Jewish event that has gathered Jews from all over the world. We know there's some 15 different national areas or regions represented of where Jews have come from. That's mentioned when there's the tongue speaking activity in the earlier part of this chapter. And then when Peter stood up to preach, he is explaining, first of all, what they are doing what the apostles are doing. They had been accused of being drunk. Peter said, it's nine o'clock in the morning. You're not hearing people that have gotten drunk in the middle of the night or in the morning. You're hearing people who are being filled with the Spirit and fulfilling a prophecy found in the book of Joel. And he begins to preach the gospel. That's what you're hearing is this message of Jesus. And he brings them through a little bit of the narrative of Old Testament, things they grew up with. And they get to this point where uh, in, he gets to this point where in his sermon, he then gets to Jesus. And he says, this Jesus, this, this, this man that was here not too long ago, this man who has been around the whole Judean countryside, this man who around the Sea of Galilee, who's, who's been in Jerusalem, born in Bethlehem, all these things, all this, this man you know about that was brought before Pilate and then Herod, then Pilate again, and the man you crucified. And he says, you crucified. He was accusing his audience of that. Because they're the ones when Pilate asks, who shall I re- release to you, Jesus or Barabbas? And they say, Barabbas, what shall I do with Jesus? Crucify him, crucify him. That's what they were asking. And there were some, I believe, in Peter's audience, probably in the same audience when Pilate asked the question, what would you have me do with Jesus? And so Peter's sermon ends this way. This Jesus whom you crucified, God made Lord, God raised from the dead. He's made him Lord and the Messiah. That's verse 36. So hone in on 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. I want you to think about if you were in the shoes of a Jew listening to Peter's sermon. And you're not just in the shoes of any Jew. I want you to think about being in the shoes of a Jew that heard this sermon, but it was also a part of the crowd shouting almost two months earlier, crucify him. Crucify him. Because you had, for whatever reason, maybe everybody else was doing it, or maybe you really had a strong conviction that this Jesus guy was indeed an imposter. And there might be varying degrees of of both of those extremes. You know, some people just do things because everybody else is doing. What are we we, uh, boycotting? I don't know, but it sounds fun, you know. We're holding up the banner. We're shouting this. We're doing this. Let's go to that rally over here. It looks exciting. I have no idea what the cause is. To I am 100% sure that Jesus is not the Messiah. Whatever degree of conviction you had from those two extremes, let's say you were in there somewhere and you were part of that crowd. And now you hear Peter's sermon. This is a gathering. You've brought your family along. 
people from all over, our relatives up in Antioch, our, our relatives over in uh, uh, Asia Minor have come down here. We've had a family reunion. We're all here doing the Jewish thing. It's the day of Pentecost. We're hearing what Peter is saying out here in the open public. And he's just called you a murderer. And guess what? You feel convicted. You don't just say, well, man, you know, you're accusing me of that. There's real conviction in this crowd. I'm not saying everybody that's hearing this is all convicted, but there's a lot of people convicted. You can see that from verse 37. Look at that with me. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And I think that that indicates they felt guilt. They felt indicted by the allegation Peter has made. If, they, if you were the one that you didn't feel like you did that, if you didn't feel like Jesus was the real deal, you would have said, that's wrong. You're a liar. Who gives you the right to judge me? Let's, let's gather up our effort and get rid of that guy, that Peter they do that with Stephen, you know, in Acts 7. And Stephen basically gave the same sermon. And by the way, Stephen's audience reacted in the same way at first as Peter's audience. They were cut to the heart too. You look at that up. <clears throat> but the reaction or the response that they give later is quite different. What shall we do? They're bothered. Their conscience is guilty. They know they were a part of that crowd. And they're, they're in the moment of despondency, of desperation. What should we do? And Peter says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what did they do? We know that 3,000 of them did exactly what Peter asked them to do. 3,000. If you look at verse 41, it says, those who accepted his message. That's an implication that some did not, but those who did were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number daily. Now, We've got this description of what this first response group does from verse 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property, possessions to give anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, let's do a little marathon of about five other places. Are you ready? Are you ready to go? Carl, you ready to go? Here we go. Acts 4.4 4. But many who heard the message believed so that the number of men who believed, men, it's only listing the number of men there, meaning there's more, but just of the men who believed grew to be about what? 514. Nevertheless, more 
and more. Men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. 6.1 In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, and then it there's a description of a problem, a logistical problem that was motivated by some prejudice between Hebraic Jews, Hellenistic Jews, their widows, on daily food distribution. They get a remedy for that and it's put into place and it becomes so effective. Look at verse 7 with me. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Just one more, 931. 931. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord, and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. What do you see happening to the early church? And what is being affected? They're growing, aren't they? They're growing. And I've stopped short of at least a good another half dozen of passages that will give reference to growth or and or increasing in number. But you don't need me here proof texting all morning long. What you need here to hear is that God is interested in the church growing. And let me be very specific. God is interested in numbers. Say that with me. God is interested in numbers. I'm about to move, cameraman. God is interested in numbers. Now you remember last week, I had you all say with me, repeating a particular point was the main point of the sermon and today I have a main point of the sermon. As a matter of fact, I'm not really going to get into three points. This is the point. But do you remember what last week's sermon was about and what it is that we said together which was the main point? Does anybody remember? I'm the same way, guys. Don't feel so bad. I mean, I'll ask preacher friends of mine, what did you preach on last Sunday? Uh, And then we all have a hard time remembering, what did we preach on last Sunday? The church is here to what? You got it. You just need a little nudge. You remember that part, don't you? The church is here to what? Stay. Remember we looked at Matthew 16. Somebody was saying that. Upon this rock I will build my what? Church. And the gates of Hades will not what? Overcome it or prevail against it. The church is here to stay. Today's statement, and this is going to be real challenging. I'm not here next Sunday when I ask you. You're going to have two weeks before I ask you. What was the point for today's sermon? But the point for today's sermon is this. God is interested in numbers. Say it with me. God is interested in numbers. One more time. God is interested in numbers. And that's for the viewing audience on the camera just to note that there's more than three people in the room. Thank you. (laughs) The church is here to stay and God is interested in the numbers. I cannot tell you how many times whenever I have preached on, taught on, or promoted through a bulletin article, wrote about church growth, 
where people have come to me and say, why are you interested in just numbers? Shouldn't we also be interested in spiritual growth? There is growth in other ways besides numbers. I am, I'm aware of that. But here's what my observation is. We've hidden behind that fact so as to not go through all the effort for the number two. We'll, we'll have prayers, and these are good prayers. And I'm not accusing everybody of this, but we'll say our prayers. Lord, help us grow in strength and in numbers, or in spirituality and in numbers. And we're doing a pretty good job with the spirituality, with Bible classes and uh, fellowships that we have, and heart to home, small groups, and those are all great but we cannot neglect the fact that God wants more here than we have now. But we're doing the other part, right? Now that may be a big generalization on my part, but I do feel I've come across a few people that feel confident that they're doing exactly what God wants them to do without having to bother with trying to increase the number. We're doing the other things. We're doing the other kind of growing. And I'm telling you, God is interested in numbers. There's a whole book in the Bible. Guess what it's called? Numbers. Now granted, there was that bit about David doing a census that God wasn't too happy about, but we'll forget that, okay? Anybody taking your census yet? Anybody taking your census yet? Only Jerry got that one. <laughs> hey, you know what you get when you boil a funny bone? Laughing stock. Now that's humorous. I'm getting ready for Dad's Day, Father's Day, Dad Jokes Part 2. So I'm, I'm, I'm collecting some. Uh, I hope Coach is. I hope Scott is. I've got those kind of going. Addison, you can collect for us too if you want, okay? Where was I? Oh, numbers. Numbers. People are saying, okay, what about that 24 to double stuff? You haven't gotten 220 and it's 2020. You failed. I don't look at it that way. We've had at least 12, a dozen or more baptisms and new additions to this church since October. Praise God for that. And God is interested in numbers, whether you like it or not. And if we are not interested in numbers, why are we here? Well, because I like just getting what I get out of it and going home. That is not the purpose of the church. I've come here to fulfill my Christian duty so I can go back home, feel good about myself and come back and I want to make sure I hear the things I already know next Sunday. We ought to be stretched. We ought to be challenged. Amen. And challenged to get out of our comfort zones and speak on behalf of Jesus to everyone we know. And when we have a big event, let's invite them. Let's tell them why you need to be here Easter Sunday because we're going to tell you about a risen Lord. Let's get everybody involved in anything we do with the interest of God working through us to increase our numbers. How about you this morning? Are you ready? Maybe you don't feel like you were there on that day uh, when they were shouting crucify him. But I want you to know something. Everybody in this room, and we all come from the same, the same condition, sin. We're all sinners. And it is our sin that put Jesus on the cross. It really is. It wasn't just the Roman soldier that, that took the spike and the hammer and was nailing him to the cross. My sin nailed him to the cross. Your sin nailed him to the cross. And we weren't till 2,000 plus years later. But our sins put him on the cross along with everybody else's sins. You need to know that. And you may not have ever said in your life, crucify him, crucify him. But you did. And I did. And we ought to be asking the question that the audience in Peter's gathering that day we ought to ask the question, what can we do about it? Peter's got the answer. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And guess what? When you do that, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be added to our number. And it will help us grow in our number. And God's interested in numbers. We're interested in your soul. Won't you do that now while we're together we stand and sing?